All right, for our next speaker, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Luis Zaman from Complex Systems and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Dr. Zaman's research blends computational and microbial evolution experiments in carefully controlled, engineered environments to better understand how complex communities shape what traits are traits are adaptive. One of the major challenges of this pandemic has been in the difficulties communicating risk and uncertainty with the general public. And Zaman's team, or Dr. Zaman's team has done a lot of work approaching this challenge in new ways, and I look forward to hearing about his team's work. So, uh, Dr. Zwan, go ahead and um, get started. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I want to start by saying thank you to MICTI for putting together this symposium and inviting me to share some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, I think it's really fantastic that we have so many experts here at University of Michigan and across the state uh, really working on this, this problem together and, and doing so in, in really innovative ways using computation. So I'm fortunate enough to get to work with some of these experts, and I wanted to spend today my time with you talking about some of the more education and outreach kind of aligned work that we've been working on. Uh, so this is work in collaboration with Emily Andrus, uh, Xu Yang Du, Marissa Eisenberg, and Elizabeth Brook. So I should start this by saying that this is not at all sort of an obvious and straightforward path for me to take. I am not sort of in the public health or epidemiological world necessarily. My research is mostly on host parasite coevolution and in particular using these kind of uh, strange digital systems uh, I also work with microbes, but but a lot of my work, at least during the pandemic, has been focused on these more computational components. Uh, so here is a population of host organisms. So these blue uh, pixels are host organisms, and these red ones are infected hosts. And actually, what you're looking at is an entire population of self-replicating computer programs. And this is the way I study host parasite coevolution, kind of from a more fundamental ecology and evolution perspective. And so I'm interested in knowing how pathogens spread, uh, how evolutionary processes are changed by this kind of interaction between hosts and parasites, not necessarily from this more you know public health perspective, right? And this is definitely my lens that I've approached these problems with. But it was really clear, uh, especially relatively early on, that this epidemic was going to get out of hand. right? And, and that became more and more apparent. And one of the challenges I had was, was I needed to, I really struggled with ways that I felt like I could contribute. I, I felt helpless, uh, to be honest, and, and I wanted to figure out sort of the best way I could use the skills that I did have and the understanding that I did have about host pathogen interactions to, to be of service broadly. And, and what it seemed like is, is that everyone was really looking for information and trying to make sense of everything that was going on. and. The more people look, the more misinformation seemed to be around, and that's certainly still the case. Uh, but you know, even relatively complex concepts like exponential growth or R not were becoming regular parts of people's vocabulary. And no matter where you looked, you found sort of complex uh, scientific questions about pathogens and the way people interact with pathogens as they're spreading in a community. And even the difference between antigen and PCR tests became sort of practical knowledge that, that people sometimes needed to, to understand. And it was clear that, that models of disease transmission were becoming really pivotal parts of policy. And, and that impacted people's lives from everything from stay-at-home orders, required testing, quarantine rules, uh, and, and many, many more sort of very practical concerns that people were having. But a lot of folks don't have intuitions for these kinds of, of models. And so this is something that I thought I might be able to help with. 
Now, I know that unfortunately the relationship our country has with math and our educational system just doesn't really leave folks with a lot of comfort or willingness to sort of sit and engage with mathematics when presented to them outside of sort of a math class, for example. So I knew that the kind of traditional approach of writing down these kind of SIR models um, and deriving differential equations and using those equations to kind of gain insight into the processes that are important in disease transmission probably wasn't going to be the way to engage the most number of people. Uh, and so instead of taking this more traditional approach, what if we gave people kind of an interactive and more intuitive way of seeing disease transmission spread through a population, right? And so maybe taking this kind of agent-based simulation approach was a little bit more approachable where we have uh, individuals here interacting and maybe pathogens infecting them in red and spreading and then individuals recovering from that infection and turning blue and you can see these kind of epicenters of of recovered individuals here uh, and maybe this was a sort of more intuitive way to engage with the same model right just in a, a, a little bit more tactile hands-on sort of way and what's really kind of interesting about this approach is you can do things like, well, what if these individuals didn't quite move around as much? And you might think of this as being maybe practicing more social distancing. And so here you can see the individual dots in this, this simulation now, they're not moving quite as rapidly. And the disease transmission is really taking a lot longer to spread through the population. And, you know, if this is something that you were uh, trying to accomplish, right? You want you want to reduce the amount of individuals that need ICU beds in your hospitals, for example. Then this is a way of showing how social distancing, this kind of limiting your interactions with other folks, can have a real impact on the kind of dynamics that we're trying to avoid. These big peaks of of epidemic spreads. So this is this is uh, one approach that I think is is pretty powerful to give people the same sort of intuition that you might get from these SIR models, but doing it in a way that's much more approachable. And the kind of neat thing about this is that this actually is all on a website. And so this this was just a video that I took of the website running the simulation actually in the browser. Now that model is useful for someone like maybe most of the audience here, people that have had experience working with these kind of things. But for, for a lot of people that that's already maybe a little bit too, uh, too much information in one go. So what, what I ended up doing was really putting together this website that kind of walks you through each individual step, right? Starting with what are agents? What is this world? Why are they moving around in this way? How do we introduce infections into the system? Can we watch those infections as they spread through the population? And all of these are simulations that are actually running in the browser in real time. So building it up one bit at a time so that you don't get overwhelmed by all of the information all at once. Uh, added even more locations. So instead of just having one, uh, one colored agent, you can have multiple agents that are in different isolated subpopulations and maybe have some migration between them. And if you do that, it, it helps to see how those interactions are creating a contact network, um, something that you can maybe feel a little more familiar with because of things like social networks. And then kind of ending with a little bit of a story, maybe talking about how you can imagine having these large city centers surrounded by smaller towns and how important migration or movement between those different locations are for uh, for the spread of the pathogen and in particular thinking about sort of how much movement is going between communities and how that can influence the kind of dynamics of, of pathogen spread. So here you can see me just moving the slider for the number of visitors that are moving between different locations. And so the idea here is that you can sort of build an intuition for the kinds of dynamics that you might expect, given these kind of heterogeneities, given you know the, the 
different scenarios that you might be interested in and you can play with those you can restart the simulation you can change the kinds of of movement behaviors that individuals have and see their effects in real time so i made a few other of these sim these walkthroughs this one i want to highlight because i think it it shows kind of another fun uh dynamic but you can have now local and global migration where local migration is moving individuals between adjacent uh, locations so there's this grid of sites and they're colored in this kind of warm to cool color scheme that wraps around back to cool and that's because there's basically a circle of of all of these different locations that individuals are moving through so it's, it's a ring network and you can see how infection that starts in one location here it started in this blue uh, blue location is going to spread through uh, the population through these these meta populations and it's spreading in adjacent uh, neighborhoods right now because those are the only things that are connected but then you can do things like add global visitors which are going to pull which will shrink the world right quite literally you will see the world all of these different sublocations get pulled together as as links start to form between individuals that are migrating between those different subpopulations and you also see how that influences the, the rate of spread of the pathogen through these different subpopulations and again this is all running in a browser so this is this is real time uh well it's a pre-recording of what it looked like in real time in my browser so this is another one that you could run you could pull up your browser and, and play with right now now around the same time that i was building these tools uh elizabeth brook was starting to pull together resources to make uh, interactive and intuitive lesson plans around systems modeling and and in particular kind of pivoted towards doing this with a focus on covid for sort of obvious reasons and it, it really made sense that that we should work together on this and I wanted to spend the rest of my time today talking about some of the work that we've been doing together. And with Elizabeth, we assembled a team, and this team is, is still growing, of, of experts in lots of different areas. So obviously Marissa Eisenberg, kind of the, the general expert in COVID modeling and epi epidemiology. Emily Andrus is sort of our public health uh, expert. And Xu Yang Du is our expert at, at user interface design. And so with all these experts in different parts of the process, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of our collective approach to, to, to building this, this tool. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Love to hear your thoughts and, and ideas for ways we could go with this. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is sort of how the storyboard and sketches kind of progressed to the current form. And a lot of this is, is thanks to Emily uh, and her just really artistic way of looking at these things. And, and she just did an amazing job. So the first kind of iteration of this was, was thinking about how we could get across this idea that there are different states that individuals can be in. And this is kind of the foundation of the SIR model is that you can break up the population into these different chunks. And what does that actually mean? And so we take this kind of very individualistic perspective where there's a single person here in this top hat that's moving through the world and they interact with someone who's sick and that transitions them into the infected state. And then after some period of time, they recover from the, from the disease. And so, so this was kind of our first sketch of the way we wanted to convey this information. And then this kind of evolved into maybe we can get rid of showing all of these different components and, and these kind of days of, of infection and just focus on the states. So put an individual on one of these color tiles, highlight them, really drive it home that we're talking about a single state. And you can imagine sort of moving through now, maybe as you're scrolling through this website, this this little individual is, is moving to the next state and their body posture changes. You can see that they're infected and now they're they're highlighting this orange infected cell, this this sidewalk block. And the same thing for recovered where now they're they're excited and they've 
they've been relieved of all of their symptoms, right? And the final iteration was to, to kind of take this and make it a little bit fancier looking, change some of the aesthetics, but also highlight the different categories on the, the block that the individual was standing on. So here you can see this S is on the, the actual location that the individual is standing on. As they move to the infected cell, the I is now highlighted, the S is gone, and you can see the individual is clearly sick now. And recovered, again, highlighting that this is the state that we're going to represent in future uh, parts of this website as R, and, and that the individual is now recovered from this disease. And what I think is really fantastic about this way of, of visualizing them as little blocks on sidewalk paths is that we can imagine what happens when two paths interact. And so here's an infected individual interacting with another, uh, at this point, susceptible individual. And so it's now potentially going to change what type of trajectory it's on, right? So this individual was always going to be on this infected path and eventually was going to recover. This one, we don't know. It depends on whether the infection was successfully transmitted or not. And so we can represent these things as part of the environment that these individuals are moving through. And I think this is a really uh, fantastic feature of this. And you can even scale this up now to multiple types of interactions and whole communities. And one of the ideas then is to sort of take that population level view and maybe maybe kind of imagine panning up to just seeing the heads and watching individuals interact and maybe that becomes reminiscent of these kind of uh, billiard ball type models so we can build back up to the level of complexity that that i was sort of already playing with in the beginning of of covid times uh, so I just wanted to also show you one little clip of some of the animation that we've been working on. So this is uh, all in-browser animation. So one of the nice things is that we can we can take these characters that Emily has drawn and use JavaScript to animate them in, in very dynamic ways. So of course, there's lots more to, to, to cover in these modules. So we're just getting started. So things like super spreading, different types of transmission pathways, so things like fomites, droplets, how transmission might be different indoors and outdoors, uh, different types of structured populations, how different types of norms might have different effects. Herd immunity, vaccine hesitancy, obviously very important topics right now. Uh, disparities in diseases, in, in disease and outcomes of disease. And how we take these, these ideas and this knowledge and transform it into policy. And with that, I'd just love to hear any of your thoughts, ideas, suggestions, or questions that you might have for, for me or the team. Thank you. Great. Well, I, I have a question already queued up for you in the discussion in, in my mind. So uh, 